Right All right. If it's horizontal on IG, will it still be? Uh, no, I think you need to have it. That's all right. That's all you wanted. Mostly it's all about the hand band. As long as they can see the hand band, I think that's it. Uh, I'm Dave. <laughs> so, what was your name? Kideki. Kideki. Nice to meet you. And crew. Crew. And Yvette. Yvette. Larry. Larry. Say. Say. S A S E I. S E I. Got it. Kaz. Kaz. K A Z. Wow. Okay, cool. Now you I'll try to remember. Yes. Okay. And did you come in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you for coming again. Again. Uh, your first time. Watch that. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Um, I uh, usually do like a little bit of a hello, how are you, and how did you find out about the class little thing. So we spoke last time. I think you came the last time. <laughs> That's how I, exactly how I, how I found out about okay. this place and that this uh, this is uh, okay through online. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Like Facebook or something like that. Uh, yeah, he, he's the one who found me. Okay, okay, great, cool. Um, I have a music teacher, and I asked him about the instrument, the hand pan. I was like, where can I learn more about this? And he said he saw you guys on the beach. Yes! So, really? <laughs> saw us on the beach. Here. <laughs> yes. That's That's awesome. Awesome. He saw us on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> I know, where were we? You don't happen to be in the, up in Malibu. Is that where you're from? No, no. Uh, I think he just lives around here, actually. Yeah, I don't oh. know. It must have been that direction. But I'm from South. I'm from uh, Newport Beach. Awesome. <laughs> wow. I don't know any band directors down there that I recall. <laughs> Interesting. What school? Uh, Sage Hill. His name's um, Brent Dodson. Oh, my gosh. No, yeah. I have no clue. <laughs> That's very like, fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe he saw a video of us on beach? Who knows? <laughs> but, because uh, we were up in Pepperdine University. Oh, really? Like that. Mm -hmm. We played up there, and then we went down to the beach. Nice. Did some videos down there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. That's the only beach I can think of immediately. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, Daniel and I, about a, a year ago, maybe not a whole year, but we were in the... Uh, a Laguna. Yeah, like the Laguna area. Yeah. The video down there. That's been a while. Cool. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Yeah. And you bet you you've been here before. Yeah. Um. Just um listening to like uh, meditative music and heard the hand pan and tried to figure out what instrument that was and then um searched like places that have them and then I found this place. Yeah. Awesome. And you're here again. Uh huh. Yeah. Hey, Larry. Um. I saw a uh, some type of documentary on on, on television and. The guy just picked up a hand pan. I was like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. Then I ended up calling, uh, looking around, and the guy's from the Ditch Project mm -hmm. in New York mm -hmm. told me about you guys. Oh, cool. Because I live in San Diego, and there's nothing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, So no, they, they told me they, they, you guys were the closest or so the only ones that they knew about. Awesome. Great. And so, are you from San Diego? Right? Yeah, yeah, I okay. drove up this morning. Drove up? Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for wow. coming. Wow. Yeah. Nice. 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 Hi, uh, yeah, I found the, uh, the group called the Hang Massive on the oh, yeah. YouTube video. Right. It, it was like amazing. Yeah. Like, Blow your mind. Yeah, it broke your mind. And yeah. then, what is this instrument for? And yeah. then I like, stopped searching, searching, and then found this place. And yeah. there's a workshop, like Adam. Uh huh. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, okay, I have to be in there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I maybe email Hideki. Uh -huh. It's like, oh, I come in the workshop. There's a workshop. Yeah, pretty nice. <laughs> Are you guys <laughs> from the Torrance area? Yeah. He is. I am. Oh, Torrance, okay. He's yeah. from Cal. Yeah. Where? Culver City. Oh, Culver City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very nice. So you drove a little bit to get here again yeah. today, too? Yeah. And, uh, uh, uh Kaz. Kaz. Uh, I'm not his, uh, wife, mm -hmm. and then he showed me the same YouTube videos. And then I actually started practicing digital, but once he brought this back to the house. Uh -huh. Wow, this is maybe I can do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You can do it. Where's our Where's our little thing? Uh, What's that? Uh, 
a little saying here. I don't believe you can. <laughs> we'll you put can. that right on your wall. <laughs> <right there. laughs> it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. You have your dream believe uh, shirt on today? No, I don't. Oh. No. That's a damn challenge. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's Daniel over there, you guys. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Hey, guys. Uh, he's got his little video camera over here. He just does a lot of videos here for us. And we, we, you know, it's the video era. So everything's on tape these days. But over here is Marlita. Hello. And she's, the, our, she's our, our newest DII uh, member, team member. Over so here. grateful, too. So, yeah. So she's getting started this week just watching things, how they go down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met Marlita for the first time at the Long Beach Yoga Festival. We had like a little booth there. And she just walked up and had, had a chat. And I even, it's funny, I even took a picture with her and put it on Instagram. Yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, this is awesome. Like, this, you know, we just met. And then like six months later, <laughs> uh, uh, Daniel's uh, girl, she goes, hey, I've got this person who's, uh, you know, interested in maybe getting a job over at the end. I'm like, okay, bring him. And then the next thing I know, I'm like, oh my god, it's <laughs> from the Yoga Fest. So, <laughs> you have totally different connections between all those guys. Yeah, yeah. Hey! Do hey. you want to stand? Do you want to stand? stand? Do you want to sit on the ground or do you want to... Yeah. You good? I'm oh, good, yeah. Sergey, right? Yes, 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 sir. This is Sergey, you guys. Hi. 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 <laughs> and, uh, I made it. Yeah, you made it. Yeah. So, Sergey, is it your second time? Yes. To the class. Right. Wow, we've got several people here for the second time. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Uh, Sergey is also a photographer. He took my picture the other day. <laughs> it was awesome. Wow. So, uh, he has a hand pan here uh, that he didn't get from us, but I tuned it for him. Um, and so, he was just so happy that he goes, Can I take some pictures of you? I'm like, Sure. So, uh, my wife loves the pictures that you took, by the way. She has it on her desk at work now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, you've done an excellent job with that. Thank you. For advertising, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is wonderful. what I do. Yep. Yeah. I make people look good. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, awesome. Um, again, thanks for being here. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a little history about myself. I don't know if anybody else has heard it already, but you've already heard it. You get to hear a little, a little bit again. Uh, so I started getting involved with steel drums back in 1990 over at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, and I first tried making my first steel drum, oh, maybe 91 or 92. And then in 1993, I made uh, some steel drums and we got a little steel drum band going over at Long Beach Poly. Um, and that went for about a decade or more. Uh, they don't have it there anymore. Uh, but then I got involved with a school, North High School in Torrance, which Daniel went there for a little while too, which I think is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was there for, I don't know, almost a decade teaching steel drum and that sort of thing. And a hand pan wasn't developed until the year 2000. So interestingly, when I was invo really involved with the steel drums, uh, I went to Finland. Isn't that where you go when you're involved with steel drums? <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Finland and uh, met some guys that were really involved with the steel drum there also. They had their own school groups and they learned to, to tune them and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> and uh, it was kind of a fun little adventure because they mentioned there were some people down, there were some steel drum tuners down in Switzerland. They were doing some weird things. Mm. Yeah, guys down in Switzerland doing some weird things. <laughs> and this is like 1998, 96 maybe. So again, the hand pan didn't come out until the year 2000. So it turns out that the people from Switzerland that were doing the weird things are the people at Panart that developed the Hang. So Hang is the original name of this instrument. This instrument we call it generically these days, we call it a hand pan. Uh, but the original one was called Hang, and the, you know, that's why they call it Hang Massive, right? It's because that was they were playing the Hang, and uh, that was a group name. So anyway, uh, I was making steel drums, making steel drums in the early 2000s. I uh, started a business called Smarty Pans. So that was my original name of my business. And uh, I made you know drums for individuals, schools. Schools were like a big thing, getting them into the schools and that sort of thing. Um, and along the way, in those early 2000s, people were saying, Dave, what? I said, I was in Brazil last month, and I saw this really cool upside, steel, upside down steel drum. Somebody was playing it in their lap. It only had like eight or nine notes on it. And it's really cool, you should check it out. And I thought, eh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really think anything of it because I was concentrating on steel drums which have 25 notes on them, mm -hmm. right? Like a gazillion notes, fully chromatic, and uh, I, that was just my focus. So I heard about this other drum and I thought, hmm, interesting. And then somebody else, a couple of years later, Dave, you've got 
to check this out. I saw somebody well, on a video maybe, because remember, YouTube came out in 2005, I think it was. So maybe around 2005, 2006, somebody said they saw something on YouTube. And uh, they said, yeah, it's like an upside down steel drum, play it in your lap, it's the coolest thing ever. I said, hmm. I still kind of dismissed mm -hmm. it and didn't go for it. I think it was 2008 or 2009, somebody else finally came to me and actually brought a hang and said, look at this, you got, you, you got to make one. And I was like, oh, hmm. Okay, I'll take a stab at it this time. So uh, I ended up using regular barrels, like a 55 gallon barrel for oil, like an oil drum. And it's what traditionally you make steel drums out of. Um, and I just cut off the sides of the barrel and then I did all the work to make it kind of look like this. Oh, and I don't have it here, that's funny. The person that I made the first one for, he actually brought it in the other day for me to work on it a little bit because it hadn't been tuned for a while. But um, yeah, I just inverted the two sides of the barrel so it would look like this. And I didn't know what scale or anything. I didn't know how they were set up. I just kind of looked at it and did my best to copy it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I ended up doing some kind of C major scale or C minor scale or something like that. Um, and so I played it and, and what struck me was when I put it in my lap and I actually played it, that's when I, the aha moment went on in my head. I just went, aha, now I know why everybody loves this so much. Mm -hmm. It was a very personal experience. I don't know if you've ever had that. I mean, some of you have played a little bit already today. But uh, when you touch and feel the instrument, uh, it's a different experience than on the steel drums when you're playing with mallets. It's kind of external. Um, it's still an exciting thing. Uh, steel drums is very much a party music kind of thing. They have it for the carnival down in uh, Trinidad. Um, so it really gets you pumped up and, uh, and alive. This is almost the opposite. It relaxes you. And you're playing it with your hands rather than with mallets. So I had to like changed my whole vision of like how I approach these instruments. It was fascinating. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, it'd be like doing rocket science, but then the next thing you know, you're instead of doing rocket science, you're doing something like brain science. <laughs> Just really wild a transition. So, um, but that moment was really a, uh, kind of a fascinating moment for me because I did understand at that point, like why people enjoyed it so much and why people were so drawn to it. So uh, that brings us up to now, and now I'm making them, and this is, it used to be the steel drums were my main part of the business, and now the hand pans are the main part of my business. Um, and so we're just excited to be here. And it's really fun having people like yourselves <laughs> come in for these classes, it's really cool. So, hey, what's, I got a question. Yeah. What's the difference, uh, the real difference between hand pan and a rap? Okay, rap, so a rap okay. drum, do we have the tongue drum over there, Marlena? Uh, yeah. So uh, that's a good question, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a little history. So, okay, subscribe. Um, again, so the steel drum came first, right? So the steel drum was the first instrument that was tuned to metal, right? Uh, when the hand pan came out in 2000, people were perplexed by it. They, I don't think people really made the association that it was like similar to a steel drum, and so they didn't understand how it was made <clears throat> or how to tune it or anything like that. When people did try, it's very frustrating. I mean, it, this is one of those instruments in a, in a craft that it, it really, literally takes years to learn it. Uh, it's not something you just take a class for for a week and then after the week class you can learn that and then you can do it and go into your business. It literally takes a year or more to learn how to do this. So uh, when people were getting, you know, disheartened, how do we make this? How do we make this? Uh, some people took an upside down propane tank, like an empty, empty propane tank, and figured out, I don't, I don't know who this person was, but they, they cut these little tongues like this into the top of the propane tank. So this is called a tongue drum. So they cut the tongues in a similar way with the same, same kind of notes uh, as a hand pan. So almost a, uh, all of a sudden you had a similar kind of instrument to a hand pan. You could play it with your hands and your fingers and that sort of thing, but it's not a hand pan. It turned out it, it became its own little industry. So now you see instruments like this uh, also. Um, and this is called a tongue drum. The uh, rab drum is a kind of like a, uh, an extra special tongue drum. Uh, this has basically pure tones that you're listening to. On the rab drum, it's fascinating. They actually have um, roots and octaves and fifths. I'm not sure about the octaves, but the fifths are tuned on the notes as well. So, and I'll explain that a little bit here, because it, it starts getting into a little bit of the technical aspect of music. But um, a rap drum is essentially a tongue drum with, like, 
the little plus sign the size, <laughs> the, size, the, size, the size of a hand pan and it, it has tongues cut out yeah so it. it's but a little bit bigger than this abandoned. yeah a little bit bigger this a little smaller than that um but it has its very own unique sound and uh it's interesting you bring that up because a lot of people are drawn to that instrument as well. that's the one i was growing yeah to. Mm, yeah exactly. that's that was a good instrument i played a couple of them at one all right but the so, hits are just similar. Like all the techniques are similar uh, on a rav drum and a hand pan. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know that these are made out of metal. This one's made out of plain steel. There's like, different kinds of steel that they're made out of. This is called plain steel, low carbon plain steel. Uh, plain steel is just regular steel. Like you go to the store, buy some sheet metal. That's usually called plain steel. This is over here, uh, stainless steel. So stainless has a slightly different sound. Uh, this one tends to have a little bit more resonance, or not resonance, but uh, sustain. Um, these are coated with a powder coating, which we call the Saturn, that's a satin. Uh, that one there has a glossy finish, and we call that the clarity coat. Um, I don't like to make instruments that are just raw steel because they tend to rest, rust, um, or they can rust. So we've had these coatings put on them, um, and uh, we really like them. Um, there's also one over there that's been uh, nitrided. Uh, the hang drum was, uh, the original hang was nitrided metal. And nitriding is a, a technique of putting the metal into an oven. Uh, you take all the oxygen out of the oven and you put in some other uh, things like, I think it's uh, ammonia and nitrogen or something like that. And it basically makes like an Oreo cookie out of the metal. So it's hard on the outside, like a kind of a ceramic finish. And on the inside of the metal is still soft, like regular steel. Um, so it has its own unique kind of sound, reacts to the hammer a little bit different when you are tuning it. Um, so it's just another way of making a hand pan. Um, so, uh, yep, so we've got two tops and the bottom. So we've got the top shell, the bottom shell. Bottom shell, you see this big hole here. We, it's a, a base port, essentially. Um, we also, it, the name that was given to it by people at Panart was called the Goo, G-U. So this is the Goo. Uh, and the top note here is called the Ding. People at Panart called these areas here that the playing areas they call them tone fields um i traditionally call them notes so i put them together now i call them tone field notes <laughs> so these are called tone field notes or tone field or notes whatever you want to call them the little uh, indentations in here <clears throat> are called uh dimples i'm not sure what they call them in another language but in english that's become the, the typical word that, that we've been using is dimples um so um Let's see. Bingo, dimples, anything else? What did I forget, Daniel? Um, All right, yeah. oh, the scale. This so uh, this is this D minor instrument. Uh, pretty much everything we have here is a D minor. Uh, Sergei's instrument was a D minor. Uh, we ended up tuning the top note to an F, made it an F major, but all the other notes should work with our D minor. So this should work fine today. Um, uh, there are different scales that hand pans are tuned to. Um, out there in the hand pan world, there's a gazillion, and a lot of people get really confused, like what's going on with these scales. One of the reasons that the scales are different is because, uh, depending on the size of the instrument, uh, the size of the instrument can kind of determine uh, there's going to be some certain notes that don't sound really clear, um, quote unquote, the bad notes. <laughs> so on this instrument, the 20 inch size, one of the bad notes is a B natural. So on this instrument, I would never tune a B natural. Uh, the 21 inch size here, the, the quote unquote bad note would be a B flat. So the larger the instrument gets, the lower that frequency goes, it goes down a little bit. So uh, with other people's hand pans, sometimes they have 23 inch diameter. I think a 23 inch diameter, like the, the bad note or the problem note is an A. So frequently on those instruments, you will not see an A. So I'll take those notes out. Um, and that's just kind of a problem with just the instrument as it is. So uh, in the string instrument world, um, like violins and that sort of thing. They all have uh, an instrument with a body, like a guitar has a body and it has like a little hole that the, where the strings go over the top of the hole. Within the, the, the air that's inside of the instrument will naturally vibrate at certain frequencies. Kind of like when you're in the shower and you sing in the shower, we all sing. Oh yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. 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 I'm so good. Well, sounds there's good. certain notes that are ringing really, really strong. You go, oh, that sounds an awesome, like an awesome note, right? And then you sing another note and it just kind of disappears in the shower. So same kind of thing with these. So there's certain notes that will resonate uh, just because of the size and just the volume of air that's in there. 
and it, it will react with the note in a bad way. Mm. So for instance, on this one, the B natural would be that note, and it just kind of counteracts and it causes dissonance rather than a good sound. So that's why a lot of tuners just remove notes and don't use those notes because it just sounds bad. Interestingly, one of the things that uh, I was fascinated with when I first started tuning drums, like I said, when I was tuning steel drums, I was doing fully chromatic instruments. Uh, all the notes were present. And um, when I learned about hand pans, I'd be, I'd be like, oh, this is a D minor scale, but there's no B flat. <laughs> why is there no B flat? I don't understand. Um, but it's a kind of a fascinating thing. Like this instrument, we have this uh, scale. I think these are all sunset scales. We call them sunset. They are in the hand pan world. It's also called Celtic minor. So you might have heard the Celtic minor term. Uh, it's basically a D minor typically. Um, and on this scale, there's no B flat. So it's not a proper D minor scale. It's just, we just name it a different name, sunset scale or Celtic minor. But it does give itself a, a certain kind of quality where uh, your brain says, that's not normal. You know, it, but by knowing that it's not normal, it kind of attracts you. <laughs> like, why is it not normal? You want to learn more, you want to get closer to it and figure it out. So I actually enjoy the fact that certain notes are missing. It, it, it's, uh, it poses a bit of a challenge creatively because you say to yourself, okay, um, without that note, how can I be creative and continue to make music? So I really like the aspect that certain things are taken away. It's like taking a toy away from a child because they want to play with it more then, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's the way the scales are developed. Um, not all scales not, uh, you know, are the same. Uh, different tuners have different scales. Um, we've developed these scales just because it's one of the most uh, scales that people warm up to. When they come into the store, I just have a wall of steel drums or hand, hand pans with a bunch of different scales. A lot of people would uh, either be confused or frequently they were drawn to the sunset scale. So we just kind of refined it down to the sunset scale because it was a one that people really enjoyed. Um, all right, so with that being said, we are going to get started with playing a little bit. And I know some of you have already done this, but um, we're just going to go slow for the people that haven't. Um, we're going to start with the ding note, and we're just going to simply learn how to hit it a little bit. One of the things you want to do is you want to touch it and get off of the note immediately. So it's similar to this little bell here. If you're having a hard time getting some sound out of your instrument, just imagine you, well, I can even pass this around. If you hit this little uh, bell, it rings, right? But if you leave your finger on it, it stops ringing. Right? So the same idea, you want to hit and come off of that bell. Hit and come off. So some kind of same kind of thing. Otherwise, if you touch, you don't want to touch. You want to strike it and come off. So let's try, we're just going to try four on uh, the right hand, four on the left hand. And slowly, ready, go. gravity when it pulls it down it naturally pulls it onto the note and just kind of strikes it so that position Thank you. 
you guys out with my the index finger. I don't think I really said that, but everybody's pretty much much their index oh. finger. Oh, you, you do middle? Yeah. Yeah, some people use middle. I was just going to say, that doesn't really matter. In fact, you might want to just get familiar with playing all of your fingers. All your fingers. Right? Uh, Adam, I think when he was here, he mentioned he likes using his thumb. And uh, so I thought that was funny because he was talking about all using his thumb and I was myself, I can use my So it doesn't really matter as long as you're, because the end, the end result is you want to have a pleasing sound, right? So you can get a pleasing sound from your thumbs, you can get a pleasing sound from your fingers. And also beyond the pleasing sound is what kind of sound do you want to get? So for me, if it's if it's gonna be a harder sound, I'm gonna use my thumbs. If it's a little softer, middle of the road, uh, use your fingers. Uh, if I wanna kinda of get a little ticky tacky sound, maybe I'll use my pinkies, right? So uh, it doesn't really matter, it just has to do with how you want to produce that tone, what your end result wants to be. So it, it kind of gets into the whole creative realm of how you play the instrument. Uh, so we're just going to use our index finger or middle finger at this point, whatever is comfortable, because uh, unless I see some kind of weird problem, uh, I'm just going to let you go with the flow and see how it works for yourself. Usually, usually you have a dominant finger. Yeah. I try to look at, it's either one of these two, yeah, and it's either the pointer or the middle. Mm -hmm. That's usually the one you play with the most, but you, you'll play with all of them. Yeah. So with that, let's uh, let's move on from the ding note. Let's move on to the right and left hand side of the instrument. Um, Adam was doing cool, kind of cool thing. He was uh, counting them up: one, two, three, four. So, uh, oh, let me just explain that to you real quick. The orientation of the instrument. So, uh, on our hand pins, we have our logo up here on some of these, uh, and the ones that have, if we start here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The one that has eight notes. The logo is off to the left, like in an eleven o'clock position. This, the, the eighth note is right at the top in the 12 o'clock position. If you have nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the logo is between the two at the 12 o'clock position. So don't really completely rely on the logo being at the 12 o'clock. It's 12 o'clock here, but on, on these you're eight good. notes, so yours is the top logo. No logo. So here's the, the top two notes, you have it set up correctly. You're good. Um, and that's how we set it up. The reason we set it up like that is because um, the notes kind of go in a sequence. So it's just the way you play it. Left, it's just a very comfortable way of playing it. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. <laughs> yeah, we'll get more on. We'll get into that a little bit later. <clears throat> but. Uh, just Adam had a kind of cool way of doing it. One, he didn't count this one, which was like, like zero. So you start here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we do it that way, one, two, three, and four. So the notes that we're gonna be playing are three and four.
uh, yeah, great. So now we've played the ding note. We've had the same kind of uh, fingers stroke on our strike on the D and the E. So you kind of get a feel of that. So now let's try going straight up the scale. So we're going to start here on the ding note with the left hand. And then you're going to go to your right hand on the, the next lowest note, which is the A. So if we want to use numbers, it's going to go ding note. I actually tilted it uh, downwards a little bit to take the front down. Why did I do that? I didn't even think about it when I did it, but it's because these notes here are a little bit easier to play now that it's tilted towards me. Because the way my wrist is, I tend to like play with my wrist being as flat as possible with my arm. And you'll notice when you when you get out to those high notes, you just kind of reach over and just like slap it like that, right? Down here. kind of tend to bend, which isn't all bad, but I'm just letting you know, like, sometimes as you get a little bit more experience, don't be afraid to change the way your hand pan is situated in your lap or on your stand. Uh, make it as comfortable for yourself as possible. Yeah, try to get it as close, because sometimes if you don't have a stand, um, they're normally played sitting down in your lap, so you want to get used to it as close as possible to your body. So if you scoot your chair underneath and try to straddle your legs underneath, that'd be yeah. the best position. Right. Another thing, yeah, it's way out here. You have to lean in to get those higher notes. And then it's a little bit weird. Don't get away from me and push the other way. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. It's perfect. So yeah, feel free to bring it on in, get it close to your body. Another way you can play these notes back here, like I was saying, uh, it, it tends to make my wrist um, bend here. You can also play those notes with your thumbs. You, know, you might see a lot of players doing that. They go thumb, thumb, right, right, right. So that kind of split up how they play each note. So it would be thumb, thumb, finger, finger. Just for fun. This is kind of a normal, like a beginning group, and normally I don't do this with beginning groups with thumbs too much. But let's just give it a try. So uh, the right hand will be hitting the, this first note. A with the thumb, left, thumb on the C. twisting motion with the thumb. So rather than a falling motion with the finger, it's a twist uh, of your arm. So it's going to be like twist, twist, flat, flat. So let's give that a try. Ready, slowly.
Okay, cool. So now let's just go back to a finger fingers. Um, let's try, uh, it's going to be the ding note, which is our zero note, I guess, zero, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to that A. Okay? So all in a row, it's going to go one, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ready, try on your left hand. Starting on our right hand on that top note, the, the A. It's going to go whatever number seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. I'm going to try that. This, in this case, it's going to be a right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. So starting on your right here, ending on your left here. Let's try that. So we're going to go backwards now. High to low. Ready? two at a time. So, so we already worked with our thumb and our finger, thumb and our finger here. If you just play those at the same time, you can play the A and the D at the same time. You can play the C and the E here at the same time. So go ahead and fill around with that for a second on your own. Go ahead and get a sound out of both notes. Just kind of slap it again. This is going to be a twisting motion. Two notes in the left hand. Is anybody else having some swirly problems at all? Good, good, good. Everybody understand? Okay, let's give it a try. So it's gonna be right, left, just slowly. Ready, and right. Actually, just uh, make that a, a, the basis of like maybe a melody if you want to play along with somebody else. So I'm gonna have you guys do that same thing we just did, and I'm just gonna play a little ad lib, um, meaning I'm just gonna toy around a little bit, and you'll see how just something simple as that can be used <coughs> as like a basis of like a melody. So let's let's do that again, and I'm just gonna play my own little thing on top of what you guys are playing. So just keep going, okay? Until I say okay, stop. Ready and.
realizing, um, uh, I want to show you another. Way. I want to show you another uh, way of uh, playing the hand pan, at least the sunset scale here that we have, uh, which can kind of move you, get you started a little faster. So what we're doing just then is we're going from the right hand side to the left hand side, um, back and forth, right, immediately one after the next. Uh, the hand pan. The sunset hand pan that we have is split kind of down the center. On the right hand side, we've got notes that work well together. So those are called D minor notes. You don't really need to know what D minor is, don't worry about it. If, if you do, that's great. If you don't, no, no big deal. On the left hand side, you've got your A minor notes, or sometimes you can even say C major, but I'm just going to say A minor. So you can play all these notes one, two, three, four, or you can play these notes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So those work well together when you're creating musical ideas. So what we were doing just then is we were going back and forth from the right hand side to the left hand side, from the right hand side to the left hand side. What I realized as we were playing that was we were going too fast between those two to really make it easy for us to catch on. So what we're gonna do now, let's just do four. One, two, three, four, and then switch to the left. going to be playing four on this side, four on the left hand side, four on the right, four on the left, and then you can kind of create your own ideas on the right, and then create your own ideas on the left, and that's just a way of stimulating the creative process and just kind of getting it started, right? So again, don't worry about if your rhythm's right or if the sound is right, just allow yourself the freedom to experiment, okay? That's what it's all about right now, okay? So let's get started together, ready, and right.
you see how that was kind of a nice, relaxing meditation, just back and forth, kind of like with the waves kind of crashing along the sea, and here we are just playing along and enjoying ourselves. And you get better, especially with the touch, uh, then you can get a little bit more enjoyment out of it, getting just a little bit um, you know, better sounds and that sort of thing. So uh, let me move on to a couple of different ideas with hand pans. So hand pans are tuned. We were talking about the raptor earlier, and I forgot to kind of move this along to the subject. But uh, each of these notes is tuned with basically three pitches. You've got a fundamental pitch, is which the, the basically the note that you hear. So say this is this note, it's a D. So you're hearing D. It has an octave on a piano. The octave is eight notes up, so it would go uh, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, right back to A, or C, D, E, F, G, A, C. Now those would be called octaves. So a hand pan has an octave tuned to it, and then uh, sideways through the length. So you'll notice that most of these notes have kind of an oval shape. And the length of the oval is where the octave is tuned, and the width is where the fifth is tuned. And the fifth harmonic on piano, if you were starting on C, you go C, D, E, F, G, C, G, D, D. If it was D, you'd be D, E, F, G, A, D, A, D, A. So you'll notice that these notes. You'll hear those in two different kind of pitches. When you hit in the center, you hear basically the full note, which would be the D. If you mute the center, hit the edge of the length, you're going to hear an octave. If you hit the, the side, you're going to hear more of the fifth. So on the ding note, that would be the fundamental or the root, whatever you want to call it. You can uh, tap, tap on the length of the note here towards, towards the edge, and that's the octave. If you kind of mute the octave here, you're going to get the fifth that's tuned to the side. And some of them react a little bit better than others. Sometimes they're very nuanced, like half an inch here, half an inch there will make a big difference in the how those sounds are produced. Um, but as you watch handpan players on YouTube and that sort of thing, you'll be watching them do all these fabulous things. And how these sounds that are coming out of them, you're like, how did they get that sound? Frequently they're, sometimes they can get a... Right there, I'm muting here with this finger and, and then striking that fifth with that finger there. And I'm not super duper gigantic pro with it, but the people that play all the time they get really good with this stuff. And uh, you can also, just like I said earlier, you can kind of mute the notes with the left hand or whatever your uh, non dominant hand is, and you can play those harmonics. something like what we were doing. press down in a very specific spot, you get this little bounce kind of sound. Uh, I call it a pitch bend. And again, it works better on some hand pans than it does on others. Essentially, so typically what I do is my finger goes almost right next to the, the ding dimple there, and I'm muting the the octave, and then I'm pushing down on the note to where you can almost see the metal kind of flexing a little bit. And when you push it down, uh, it has a lower sound, and then when I release, it goes up. Sometimes it works on some hand pans better on the opposite side. And like I said, if your finger is like half inch over here, it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, 
because this one's are tight. Yeah. Usually see how it's 90. Yep. There you go. Three <laughs> angle. And that one usually goes the opposite sense. You kind of goes opposite. Push it down and push it. Push it. tone fields, you can use the dimples and do the same exact thing. Yeah. Oh, right, right, yeah, so like, you can kind of bend those notes in a similar way. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Awesome. And again, certain, certain drums have different qualities about them. Not every drum reacts exactly the way the other one does. Alright, cool. So, uh, we're going to move on to something a little bit different. Um, so, the space between the notes is called the interstitial metal. And the interstitial metal, uh, I, in the past when I was making steel drums, I called it the dead space because it's not supposed to make any sound. Uh, it's kind of like a skeleton between all the notes. So we, these notes are vibrating, and then you want a space that doesn't vibrate, and then you want a space that does vibrate, and you want a space that doesn't vibrate, and a space that does, right? It just kind of keeps them separated. So the dead space can actually be in a nice spot to create these little metallic tones, kind of like a drum set, like a... Um, like a drummer playing a drum set. So this space, so you can use your left hand or right hand. Um, I usually smack it with a finger. You can smack it with all four, three, four fingers if you want. You can do it with your thumb. Uh, whatever it is, I tend to use my finger. Uh, for me, uh, I tend to hold my finger onto the metal. Uh, you can just smack it like that.
So, um, if you ever want to, you can also play the bottom. They have these kind of like little fork thing that you can uh, change the pitch. If you get your head or you get close to it, you can hear the nice bass tones. Boom, 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 right? So, uh, depending on how it's uh, made, you can get different sounds out of it. A lot of people like to play with the metal tones. You know, like uh, I think Adam had you guys learn um, like a little thumb finger pattern. I can't remember if it was from the thing that 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 thing yeah, just for fun, like if you wanted to play with somebody else, maybe doing some kind of like a different kind of percussive thing, you can do like a thumb, thumb, finger, finger, thumb, thumb, finger, finger, you can get better at it. So say somebody else is playing along, you can kind of do some rhythmic variations on it. So you don't have to just only play the top, you can also play the bottom. Um, does anybody have any questions? So, what, um, I know that Castle likes to stuff it. What scale do you like the most, and what material do you like the most? Oh, just me personally? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, for me, it kind of the material depends on like what I want to play on it. Okay. So if I want to play more meditatively, I think I like the stainless. Okay. It's got a, like a, a long sustain, oh. so like I can just sit here and hit notes, kind of sustain, right? <laughs> and it's really nice for that. Um, if I want to play a little bit uh, more rapidly, or I don't know. Uh, something just a little not meditative, more performance maybe, then I might want to play on a satin or a clarity. It just has a little bit more of a punch to it, and, and sometimes when it has a lot of sustain, it kind of covers it up a little bit. So uh, it, for me, it's kind of, because I'm a tuner and I make them, <laughs> I have a choice. <laughs> Which one do I want to play for? Uh, it's funny, usually, usually a lot of the so-called professional players will have several different hands. Yeah, a lot, so, of, a lot of different Or they'll play two at once. Or they'll switch songs depending on like the hand because there's different scales. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like any instrument, uh, especially like guitars. Yeah. Or ukuleles, you buy like different ones for different tones. You have like bass guitars. You know. You have like regular acoustic guitars, yep. classical guitars. They all have some different things. So yeah. Amp hands is similar. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I have a little more sustain. Uh, these have a little more punching uh, edginess to them. Um, uh, what was it? Scale. Uh, the scale, uh, I like the Sunset scale a lot. Uh, it does offer a lot of options without getting to be, uh, I don't ever really feel boxed in. There's certain scales, uh, for instance, it was, um, the Hijaz. Hijaz is an awesome scale. It sounds like you're in Persia. It sounds like you're over there in Persia with, uh, uh, what are they called, the dancing girls with all the jingle all over? Belly dancers. Belly dancers. <laughs> Man, it's like you, you play the Hijaz, all of a sudden you expect belly dancers to walk in the door any second. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's really awesome, um, but if you don't want to be in Persia, you, you can't escape it. So, um, also like the Akebono scale is a wonderful scale, but if you don't want to feel like you're in Asia or Japan, then it's uh, sometimes uh, you can't escape that, right? It always has that one sound. This scale, for some bizarre reason, I don't know where I am when I play it. Like, I don't feel like I'm in Persia, I don't feel like I'm in Asia, I don't feel like I'm in the United States, wherever it is, right? It just has this kind of... Yeah, getting the universal sound to it. Uh, there, um, I, the pygmy scale is a very similar to the acapona scale. It's only one note different than the acapona scale. Uh, it sometimes can trap you a little bit into a certain sound, but it still has this interesting um, sound where it's kind of like we're talking about like a universal sound. So I don't have a pygmy scale here to show you, but pygmy scales is kind of something similar to that. So if a customer request for mm. a certain scale. Mm. You, you can actually mm -hmm. make it. Sir, well, to some degree, there's certain scales that will work. Like, remember, I was telling you earlier that certain notes yeah, don't work. Um, yeah, so it, it all has to do with uh, will the scale work? Because I don't want to make something that sounds bad, mm -hmm. right? So if it doesn't sound good, I don't want to make it. But if it sounds good, then yes. So the, I have experimented with lots of different scales. So I've been doing this in my 10th year of making hand pans. And so I've, I've already experimented with a lot of different scales. So I already kind of know which ones sound best. Okay. Uh, so I do have some pig, pygmy variations that, that sound nice. Um, but like if you were to say something like, hey, can you give me a pygmy in uh, F or a pygmy in um, G flat? You know, <laughs> they're like, well, I'm not sure if I can do G flat, but maybe F would be better. You know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, 
Yeah, uh, there's another scale I like called Equinox. Um, the Equinox, I've got a scale on the Equinox, it sounds great on the, this, this size here. Um, it's interestingly, it's an F sharp Equinox, but it has a really nice clear sound. And it's again, it's like another scale where I feel like I've got all sorts of options to play, but I don't really feel boxed in by a certain sound. Yeah, I like the Equinox a lot. Yeah, what we're doing here at Dave's, we're, we're you know, Dave, D minor scale has been like popular scale throughout the hand. Yeah. And so we kind of consider it a standard scale. So we kind of keep our pans in that scale. So as you notice, we can all play together. Yeah. Which is which is it's a lot place. better. And yeah. like in the learning experience, since it's so new, it's easier to teach people because all the techniques are the same. Like you can have a different pan. You can just switch the pan and use all the same techniques that you use on a D minor. So it's a matter of learning all the techniques, and it's easier when everybody has the same pan. And as you can see, we're jamming in here. It's fun. Yeah. I was excited. I was like, yeah, that's cool. And then we're all together, which is really yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try it. Yeah, 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 try it. Yeah. 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 Well, that was another question. I mean, do you have experience with music? Yes. Well, what, what did you play before? Uh, like guitar, bass guitar. OK, so you've, you've experimented with multiple instruments. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's yourself? <coughs> um, Mostly guitar and piano. Okay, yeah. Guitar. Okay. No, no, no awesome, okay. Guitar. Guitar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to piano, but it's wrong with that, my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Guitar. Guitar, okay. Yeah. That's crazy. So, <laughs> so Larry, it's impressive that you're, you're taking this step. Because, you know, seriously, like, people that are not familiar with music at all, mm -hmm. I can see that it's a big step. It's like, well, I'm going to try this. <laughs> I, I explained it to somebody else. It's almost like me walking into a dance class. I feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing in a dance class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, want, I, feel, I would be very, you know, really, uh, I don't know, anxious. I'd be like, oh, my gosh, don't want to look bad. You know, whatever I do, I'm, like, hypersensitive about it, you know. So, and the so. piano's not, it's not too intimidating. You no. Know, you see a guitar, piano, and you're like, oh you know, my god. Piano or guitar, yeah. it's like, what? Yeah, so I'm always impressed with people people like yourself who come on in mm -hmm. and just step, that one extra step, you know, give it a shot. Give it a try. Yeah, yeah, it's great. What'd you think so far? Did you like it? No, I definitely like it. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah. I like the sound. Yeah, very much. So. You know, no, it's, a, it's a great instrument for a lot of different things. Meditation-wise, if you guys just want, like, if you're just want to listen to a good sound, I could sit there for an hour playing it. Yeah. And just sit and hang out. It's like yeah. super fun. And then playing with other instruments. I play the ukulele with you guys just so you can see what it sounds like with another instrument. That's also fun. <laughs> and then trying to come up with different, like this instrument's so new. The techniques that we teach you, there's other techniques. But it's an opportunity for guys that are new to just bring their own music into it and use their own techniques and playing the hands on. That's what I love about it. And it's pretty portable, which you can take anywhere. I love playing in like fields, valleys, find valleys, go to buildings and a stairwell. Oh, and yeah. Listen to it. Oh, oh, my God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Under bridges. Wow. Uh, just find like little holes in like. I haven't done it in a cave, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I gotta do that. I gotta find a cave. It's just like echoing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like, yeah, do it. We, we were just, we just got back from Hawaii, we played on the edge of a volcano. That's right. Oh. And it was echoing through like the lava rock. It was awesome. I was like, oh my god, this is an experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just totally imagine cool. the sound vibrating mm -hmm. again. It's just howling wind, 10,000 feet, but you can still hear the pan and it's just, yeah, swirling it, around it's you. just swirling around you. Yeah. It's so awesome. It's like it's just an experience. It's yeah. cool. Super fun. Go on the beach, listen to the waves. Yeah. Go next to a waterfall. Oh my god. <laughs> Are there any <laughs> instruments that don't sound good with it? Um yeah, I would say um trumpet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not saying it's not you know impossible. Uh, but uh, I like uh, you guys are familiar with the Australian didgeridoo. Yes, right. Sounds great. Band, band. Uh, Native American flutes sound great. Uh, usually, kind of 
warmer yeah. instrument, not so edgy. Like you said, trumpet is kind of an edgy sound. Clear. This is a warm sound, so mm -hmm. you know, having that little edginess is like a little bit uh, odd. Uh, I played with a uh, cello player. I love it. It sounds great with cello. Yeah, it sounds great with cello. Yeah, I think even just regular strings in general would sound good, violin, all that sort of thing. Um, piano too, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to play with bagpipes. Oh, <laughs> yeah, bagpipes. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, nice. Oh, oh, nice. I don't know what is, is it. It all does depends. that back kind of a certain key. Yeah, it depends. Uh, and, yeah, but I don't know. It just seems like again, it's kind of like that edgy sound versus the mellow sound. Mm -hmm. Because they play like if you see like if you go online, they have didgeridoos. Like, they'll play at the same time the didgeridoo. Mm -hmm. and, 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 so like I, I consider a didgeridoo almost kind of like a trumpet. So I don't know. Maybe my. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but ultimately, it depends on the performance and how yeah. good the performers are. Okay. Like, if you get a rock and piccolo player with a rock and handstand player, <laughs> they're gonna make rock and roll. They're gonna make it work. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yes, they're with gonna make it work. With the sitar, and then like sitar. Oh yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be sweet. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had a couple in here. The guy that bought Dave's first amp that he brought it back like a few weeks ago. It was so awesome. I really love it. But they do. Uh, they're from New York, and they do. Like kind of a jazz, and she tap dances, and he plays the pan. So like, and it was like, wow. I was like, wow. and she goes, Bleh. and then she was like, and I was like, whoa, that's kind of cool, actually. Yeah. So there's honestly like every like the questions that you guys have is like they're not impossible. I would say it's up to you on what you guys want to do, and I, what I find in music, that's what it is. It, it's just an instrument to let your let the music that you have in you and use it to your advantage or. <laughs> like you know, make up work. something. Yeah. Because everybody I've seen play this hand pan, it it's it's a trip because they all sound different, and you can tell who's playing because they're putting their music into it and their little ticks and all that, and you can really hear it on the hand pan. Yeah, cool. no, it's amazing. Yep, like one hand pan and five different performers that all sound different on it. Yeah, it's totally it's amazing. So, uh, it, yeah. it's, it's just amazing. So. You know, whatever it is you guys are looking for in an instrument, this is just fun. It's it's, it's pretty awesome to have in your house. <laughs> it's like having your piano in the house. You sit down, you play a little bit. This is 